Apex Great Salt Lake. And we asked Denise to moderate this panel because one thing Save Our Great Salt Lake has done such an amazing job at is mobilizing artists. They have their Artists for Great Salt Lake campaign, and all of you hopefully had a chance to grab one of the posters that we printed, which was part of that campaign. Um, and that has also been the background image we've had throughout the break have been some of those contributions. So I'm going to pass it over to Denise, and she'll introduce our panelists. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm so excited for this panel. Like Brooke said, I'm Denise Cartwright. Super excited to um, introduce our panelists, all of these incredible artists. Um, we've got Holly Steinman's in here. Uh, Nancy Moore, Doug Tolman, Willie Paloma, and Amy McDonald. And they're all going to give you a deep dive into who they are and what their work is. Real fast, I just wanted to introduce myself again. Um, so I'm Denise Cartwright. I run Save Our Great Salt Lake. So we are a coalition of organizers and artists and business owners and just concerned citizens who are working to prevent ecosystem collapse at Great Salt Lake. So we are hosting educational events and putting out infographics and really just doing everything we can to get the word out um, and build a grassroots coalition to help us push our legislators to take substantive action to save the lake. Um, I am not an expert in Great Salt Lake. I'm not a scientist. I am a small business owner. And so I decided to use my skills in social media and marketing to help get the word out about this issue. And I knew that the best way to get the word out quickly um, was to collaborate with our incredible uh, community of artists in Utah. Our very first campaign at Save Our Great Salt Lake um, is actually an ongoing campaign that's still happening. If you're an artist, please contribute. It's our Artists for GSL campaign. And um, you may have seen some of the images up on the slides, and there's prints out there of some of the contributions um, that have been submitted to this campaign. Basically, the only rule is that um, it says save our Great Salt Lake. So we wanted to see like the variety of interpretations um, of Great Salt Lake and of this crisis. And we've received um, around 100 submissions, really, really beautiful and diverse array of art um, conveying these incredible artists' feelings and thoughts about this devastating eco crisis. So definitely check it out. Um, submit to the campaign if you're an artist. Um, it's been a really great way to get the word out and to engage with our, our local artist community. So this is a conversation that I'm really excited about and interested in and just really thrilled and honored to be here with these incredible artists who are using their work to get the word out about Great Salt Lake and other important issues in the community. So to get started, I'm going to have each of them spend a few minutes talking about um, their work and their background and how they're bringing awareness to this issue. So we will start with Amy McDonald. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. I'm the founder and director of Raleigh Arts, and we are dedicated to creating meaningful art and vibrant communities through civic and artistic collaboration and experimentation. So what does that mean? Well, we really focus on addressing major issues with local relevance, hence we're involved in the Great Salt Lake as we're passionate and care about it and we're taking it on. Our project is called Evaporation. What does it take to leave enough water for Great Salt Lake? Um, excuse me, the way that we work is any project that we take on, it must be of, by, for, and with the communities we're working with. We have a mantra that all stakeholders, which includes artists, anyone invested in whatever issue we take on, has a voice at the table. We prioritize quality programming over quantity, and we always pay artists. <laughs> we also believe that the arts, culture, and humanities are some of the most non-threatening mediums we have to bring people together around these major issues to come together and create a dialogue, step into it. Today, what we're going to do is because we are a performing arts organization and we include all the mediums, is we're going to give you a sample of our process today. Let me describe how we do it. What we do is we first increase awareness, beauty, value, for whatever issue, so this is Great Salt Lake. And how we do that is we value our process. We strive for an excellent process because it will take care of the product. So our process is to do tons of research, gather information, fact, personal story, narrative, history, 
distill it down into something manageable so that when we come to you, we have something to offer that will hopefully touch your hearts and engage your minds. Once we've inspired or invited you in to our topic, our conversation, the work that we're doing is when we can then begin to talk about what's really going on. And so for Great Salt Lake, with our project, we hope to touch your hearts, inspire your minds, and invite you into the process. Then we can talk about what's really going on, and then we can look at possible steps, action steps, to save Great Salt Lake and envision, and envision a healthy future for her and all of her intelligence. So with that being said, one more thing I'll say about our process with Great Salt Lake is we have experienced there's been a lot of they blame, negativity, whatnot. So we have made a commitment that everything that we do in this project will be verifiable and that we also want to stick to our approach of increasing awareness, value, and beauty for Great Salt Lake and all of her inhabitants, step into what's really going on and look for solutions. So I'm going to turn this over. Oh, uh, sorry, one more explanation. <laughs> what we're going to share with you today is a really cool thing. We're going to share with you excerpts of the narrative of a piece that we will showcase in full tomorrow out of Antelope Island. We have a whole big presentation for all of you. I hope you will come. And this is a narrative, and we're sharing excerpts from the narrative. And then to take you a step further, the dancers that you have, dancers and artists, are going to step into their response to this narrative. So Thea is um, the co-creator of programming and content and design at Burley Arts. Great. Um, all right, so we thought instead of showing you the dance that we're hopefully gonna show some of you tomorrow, um, we're gonna actually show you our kind of authentic and messy process as dancers. So if the dancers don't know what they're getting into. I haven't give, given them any sense of what they're about to do. Um, they're going into this blindly. I am just going to give you this framework that the body is this incredible vessel that holds space for synthesizing the intellectual, the emotional, the instinctual, uh, personal narrative, personal experience, connection. And I'm asking these dancers to come on out and rather than show you some work that they've been working on, I'm going to ask Sophia Katrubas to come read an excerpt of her piece. Um, she started working on kind of this notion of policy development and all of the obstructions that get in the way of the water getting to the lake. I'm going to play some music dancers. We're going to have some words. I want you to respond, integrate, synthesize, and just see what comes up for you. So this is them making stuff on the spot. This is what we call body research, y'all. <laughs> Reservoir, a cavity, a hard wall, a line of a hydroelectric machine to run through, a tool of reclamation. But what happens when there is nothing left to reclaim because the water becomes an apparition, putting out, pouring out, draining herself? The illusion of abundance always allows for some amnesia. Before terminating in Great Salt Lake, Bear River and its tributaries run through 61 reservoirs, like 61 Hail Marys. Please, God, let there be water in the desert today. Hiram, Condi, Cutler, Foster, Glendale, Twin Lakes, Hudson Creek, Glendale. Each in town spares water, holding it back from Great Salt Lake. Alexander, Fort Creek, Larson, Daniels, Mantua, harnessing the power of each drop and subduing the rush of the river into a placid pool. Hold your breath. Hook, Curl, Lakey, Little Valley, Lower Rapidan, all while her cold stems. You have no choice but to sing. There's a suffocation that occurs when reservoirs swell up. But lambs cannot cry out like babies do when they are baptized. Both acts still leave me questioning if submersion could ever bring us into the depths of reclamation. All right, so we're 
right, so in our process, Uh, this is the play, right? And then we would say, okay, what's the most for you? And how does that feel? And then we would start to synthesize all the things that are synthesized and hopefully create something that actually represents all of them. Sounds like I need a mic. Um, <laughs> we would plan on doing one more, but I feel like we're also a little bit out over time. So I think I'm going to ask what's best. I think we are over time. Okay. But thank you so much. Thank you, y'all. <laughs> Thank you all, oh, beautifully. Thank you, Amy. Okay, next, let's get uh, Willie. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, a few things about myself, just as like what I do professionally and what I do artistically. Um, professionally, I coordinate the Utah Humanities Book Festival, which is currently running um, and features over hundreds of events all across um, Utah, so Southern Utah, Northern Utah. And as a part of that, we do include an environmental lineup of events that are designed to bring in authors like folks from Tory House Press, like folks um, from across the country who do speak on a lot of issues we are engaging with and wrestling with today, including folks like me and too. Um, so that's one angle of a large part of the work I do. Um, you can follow it on Instagram and Twitter at Utah Book Fest or on Facebook at Utah Humanities um, Book Festival. And we also have a website where you can check out that lineup if you are interested in more spaces where you can learn from folks who spend a lot of time thinking about things like this. Um, Recently, the other stuff I can point to doing in the community are things like Plumas Colectiva, which is just a collective of Latinx creators, so writers and visual artists. And we've been doing some public events, um, and they've all been held at the Jordan River Nature Center as part of the Tracy Aviary. Um, as a collective, we've been focusing mostly on building BIPOC-centered creative spaces, open mic -like sort of slam events, writing workshops, things like that for um, communities of color to feel like they have a space where they can engage with an audience um, that is BIPOC-centered. Um, one of the biggest struggles of being like an early, um, like young artist of color frequently is that you are taught to respond or to write towards the white audience. And the, one of the biggest like kind of milestones a lot of young creators reach is when they realize like, oh, I can speak to, I can center my community. I can do that work. Um, so I wanted to mention that briefly as far as like the sort of work that I do and I'm engaged in. I'm a poet, a translator, a writer, kind of at large and I've been publishing. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of my work hasn't been environmentally oriented until recently. Um, it has been deeply activist oriented, just inevitably, just because of who I am. Um, but it's only been recently that it's been environmentally oriented. Um, since I was talking about the book festival in Bumas Colectiva, um, I want to say that a huge part of what we strive for in our events um, is active engagement. So you're not just going to be listening to somebody speak, you'll be creating yourself or you'll be moving around. Um, and this looks a lot of ways. What I've learned most from the environmental writers that I admire and I've been reading is the need to get people out into the landscape so they develop a personal relationship of love with the landscape, because that um, beyond other things you can be doing, developing that personal relationship will create that love that will create the force that will sustain you through whatever advocacy or like whatever movement you feel like you do need to do in your life. Um, with that in mind, um, part of what we're doing at 6 p.m. today at the Jordan River Nature Center is doing bird-inspired qigong, which is like Chinese yoga and reading bird poems alongside it. And we have this wonderful like bird scientist there who can like even tell you what birds are flying in and out. So it's going to be fun. And this is just like one aspect of it, bringing the like healing of the body, which qigong is designed to do, along with like the love for nature and learning from it on how to apply it to heal ourselves. Um, I'll read two poems, I think, if there's time. Um, I think that's an expectation, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, this first one, I got to give credit to for Nan and her wonderful project, Irreplaceable, the collective poem for the Great Salt Lake. Um, a lot, you can see the ripple effects of that work, and this is one of them. Um, it's called Praise to the Baby Pelicans. Salt white feathers tarred like filthy and immaculate prophets. We must all be notorious ready to die for your gospel of crack and eggshell. Each of your feathers is a quill, 
a page of the Book of Life black with our gasoline. Nobody reads books anymore for fear of what is written about them. Airs of air and cloud, blood brothers of breath and wind. Your bones are snow that never melts, only glistens. You are disgusting and pure. The guilty condemn you only because innocence pains them. It pains me to see the twisted hay of your feathers, the weak air melting beneath your wings until you land like a ripped grocery bag, eggs broken, milk claiming a consonant on the tile. Ravens will dive, foxes sniff. They will join you in your sticky grave, devoured by their hunger. Rest now, young one. This pain is for the living. If you've ever been to the spiral jetty, I had, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> if you've ever been to the spiral jetty, um, I had the blessing of being able to go with Jamie Butler. Um, and he took me to the tar sand parts where you'll, you'll see like a bunch of different like skeletons of the um, baby pelicans that kind of land there. Um, and the animals that end up dying, um, either trying to eat those animals or because they end up winding up in the tar pits themselves. Um, and that environmental impact is a huge part of what we we're talking about today. Um, I'll end on this other poem that has a lot more to do, yes, about the refuge that nature gives us and yes, like the healing power that it has. And I'll leave it at that. Between mud and slush. Fur gentle as smoke, blueberry stained gums, thumb at your temple, breath of pine and ice, a hawk in an empty sky searching for a neck, the jackhammer of woodpeckers beak deep in brush and bark. The deer look at me like I'm in the wrong neighborhood, feet in a stream wiggling like amphibians. I can't pretend I know the names of the trees. The creatures who live in the holes, pocking the muddy trail. What I like most about this place is I'm not even here. My mind holds its breath as I breathe with you, the sky reflected in the lake's eye, blinking back red yellow tears. How grief is suspended in the water somehow. Quiet. Look, it's a moose. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, my name is Douglas Holman. I am an art youth educator on one side, and I'm a sculptural artist on the other side. So everything I do lies somewhere on a spectrum between those two things, and pretty much everything is directly related to the Great Salt Lake. Um, I don't know, we're going to hold a slide or two. Um, Visually, you might not be able to tell that they're all works made by me, but everything always ties back to the Great Salt Lake watershed. Perfect. Um, so this is a piece that I call, Where Are You? And it is a nomadic trailhead kiosk that travels around to different places of socio-ecological significance in the Great Salt Lake watershed. It reverses the role of the kiosk from being the didactic portrayer of information telling you where you are and asks people who encounter it to interact with it and tell the map of where they are. Um, so this is something that I hope can meet people. Um, for example, it was at Antelope Island State Park interacting with tourists for a long time. It's attended Friends of Great Salt Lake summer camps and taught map making workshops with K through six youth. Um, it went to the Great Salt Lake Issues Forum and interacted with scientists. Um, so that it's just something to take a step back and interact with your sense of place. And um, yeah. And then if you want to go to the next slide. And then this is a piece I titled Last Gesture. It is a sculpture made from a reclaimed pine palette that I stripped all the metal off of, and then I reformed it into a tree-like shape. And I took it out to the Great Salt Lake and um, put some salt in it that I had purchased from Morton Salt uh, and made a short film about it that was a recent winner of the Climate Art Awards. 
And if you want to see the short film, that's kind of the main part of it. You can see it on the climateartawards.org. And um, I guess just to round it out, I I see that there's a lot of really amazing symbolic artwork that, as Willie said, is good for like sharing your personal relationship um, with people and encouraging them to develop theirs. And then there's really good activist art, which I would call what Save Our Great Salt Lake has been doing to mobilize. And then uh, to where I think that uh, my art sits is in a place that can ask questions and get people to engage with their sense of place and their understanding of the lake and what their role is in preserving. So, yeah. Hi, it's amazing to be here with these artists. I feel really happy right now. My name is Nan, she, her pronouns. I am uh, a lake-facing poet. I um, founded a a collective and a practice called river writing, and I'm a facilitator of that practice. Um, and the practice is a community held uh, generative writing practice. Um, so, like the dancers who are so amazing, um, what it's a kind of a writing version of this where we get together in intimate groups, they're normally groups of eight or nine folks. Um, and we just hold space by making community agreements not to judge each other, to keep confidentiality, to be kind, and so on. Um, we hold space to create in good company, um, in, in the imperfect mess of it. And it's really joyful to have a place for that. I, I founded this so that I could address um, two tyrannies. One is um, isolation, a lot of us suffer to varying degrees from feeling isolated, doing things alone. Um, when we're making art together, we're the opposite of alone. And then the other uh, tyranny is perfectionism. And although I really admire and appreciate performance, when I'm talking about art today, I'm talking about what every single person in this room has with them right now. Your voice, your gesture, your ability to um, respond to relationship, um, with expression. That's art. And the lake needs ours. The lake needs our voices and our art. And there's not time to finish your MFA. You didn't already. Right? So um, when I'm talking about art, although I have great respect for performance and what it takes to get to, uh, you know, some kind of expertise, I really am talking about what we make, what we carry, what we can offer. Um, so I wanted to give that. And then just other, the other little piece of introduction is this. I was uh, really fortunate to be uh, the poet in residence on Antelope Island. Um, I kind of made that gig up. <laughs> and actually, to be more specific, and it was supported very generously by Utah Humanities, also by Jamie Butler, who assigned herself to be the scientist in residence. And that was awesome. But uh, I would have been along with the community of folks, especially these writers, the river writers I'm talking about. We held vigil and we stayed for 47 days and nights on the island um, during this Utah State Legislative session. How that came about was um, I was invited to do that by the lake. And how that came about is I was listening to the lake, writing to the lake, dreaming about the lake because I listened to Radio West with Bonnie Baxter um, last summer and, I, and it caught my attention. And then it caught my devotion. And without going into a lot of other details, it led to this vigil. So one way to explain the vigil is the lake beckoned me and therefore beckoned us and we came. I cry really easily. <laughs> so this is what's happening now. And I'm not going to apologize for it because salt water is salt water, right? Um, I do want to say this we'll be doing the vigil again during the upcoming legislative session. At the, the next uh, segment of the final segment of this day, is we're going to be reading a poem. And by we, I mean all y'all. Um, you're going to get a piece of paper in your hand with poetry on it in this ceremonial reading that we'll offer to the lake. And so born of the vigil, people coming out and writing, bringing their writing, um, people who, by the way, don't always identify as writers or poets happen to make 
writing and poetry. <laughs> and that was awesome. In one way, uh, so it, it created a work we call Irreplaceable. And Irreplaceable in one way is like the longest love letter ever to the lake. It's also a chorus of praise and lament. Um, and I might say a little bit more about it when it was just the last segment, but what I want to say is it's a community call, a community cry, a community prayer, and the lake can hear it. The lake can hear it and say, if you're willing, you'll help it be read to the lake. You can actually read to the lake from here, which is amazing. Um, that might be enough for me. I have poetry, but I got a whole other segment to bring that in. Um, so I, I think probably time when I'll just thank you for your attention. Thanks, man. Folks, gonna show some of my slides in a second. My name is Holly Simonson. Uh, I'm an artist and a poet. Uh, do you have an MFA? <laughs> 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 um, I've been working in eco eco poetic collaboration with Great Salt Lake for over over ten years. Um, and my working thesis is that ecologically disrupted sites offer access points for the human body to experience language as part of the earth. Um, my work involves the practices of trespass, erasure, and witness. And in my artistic work, there is an emphasis on queering of the ecology uh, and dismantling. Or, uh, and what I mean by that, we could talk about that forever, and I'm sure lots of you study that. Uh, but what I mean by it is providing alternative thought paths for some of the systems uh, that we typically frame environmental injustices. Um, I am fortunate that I can use a small portion of my MFA in my day job, wherein I work for Friends of Great Salt Lake. We are a nonprofit with a mission to preserve and protect Great Salt Lake, and we have been trying to do that since 1994. Uh, part of my job at Friends of Great Salt Lake is running the Albert Lamborn Arts Program, which everyone on this panel has been part of in some way <laughs> over, the, over the years. So I'll talk uh, a little bit more about that. Um, when we get to it, uh, but oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. So trespass is the first thing um, I want to talk about. I I employ trespass as a literal poetic practice, uh, moving through landscape over barbed wire. Uh, you can look at the next one too. Um, so this is a piece of mine <clears throat> that is both. This is sliver cleave. Uh, it's a site specific installation. It was a performance. Uh, and then there's some photography and words associated with it. Uh, but basically the point is, it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was an access point and I use that access point to move my own body through this barbed wire from one site to another site, uh, tracing the animals who did that before me. Um, so trespass is an important part. I'll also talk about erasure and Great Salt Lake was my first artistic collaborator. Uh, <laughs> I put uh, giant pieces of fabric on which I had written lines of poetry actually into the lake and left them there for very long periods of time. And when I would come back, I would always find one. Uh, and the salt had erased portions of, of that text. Um, and so I would say, you know, the, like the theoretical practice behind that is again disrupting the predominant narrative. Uh, so for me, I would say, here's my work, then erased by another. Here are my ideas revised by Great Salt Lake very literally. Uh, and I believe that's really the essence of, of kind of a more than human influence um, in, in the work. And then the next slide is a piece from uh, a work called Ancient Baby, um, which was also a site specific installation. Uh, that turned into a performance that turned into pastel on paper uh, with a textual overlay. Uh, ancient baby addresses a uh, found pronghorn baby carcass that had found over the lake uh, and worked with it for over or over 200 days. Uh, that was actually matching the gestational period of pronghorn antelope. Um, so you can kind of see that my work is a little out there. Um, <laughs> And it also always takes different forms. Um, and I'll talk about why that is um, maybe a little bit too, um, but I'll also cruise through. Uh, and the last thing that I do uh, is really work with witness. 
Um, so our careers, I think, as artists or bodies who possess language are, are always met with this strange ideology about where language originates, um, what it's for, and, and which causes it should be employed. And my practice is to question that language. Um, and more important for me is to work backward into the origins of language um, and to figure out where language exists in our bodies which is why so much of my work takes on a performative, uh, a performative movement uh, action. Um, so this is a uh, untitled site-specific performance at the tar pits um, that were just mentioned. And this is all, all that exists from that particular event. So I'm done. <laughs> and then I have a few more slides of my work. This is from, 111, which is a site-specific installation, also a performance, also turned into a gallery installation. Uh, these are pre-alphabetic glyphs. This is just one uh, made from, made from uh, Great Salt Lake water and breast milk on paper. Uh, the stylist to create these was uh, Pelican Bone and Bison Hair. And then here's a piece from Glyph, uh, also a site-specific installation that turned into a gallery installation that turned uh, into uh, a language incision. Uh, this is made from cow rib bone, sagebrush, and gold feathers. And then here is a uh, part of CIST. Here is an installation that stayed an installation that was meant to be an installation. Um, they are inflated trash bags. Uh, in an enclosed space arranged and lighted as Brian Trent Sis, um, which was part of a, an installation I did in Vermont um, to introduce people to Great Salt Lake. And then the last piece I'll show is from Lake Lines. Uh, Lake Lines is rice pepper, rice paper um, set up. You can see the left panel is ink on rice paper ink was drawn with a fragmented stylus. And then the right panel is Great Salt Lake. Um, I set up rice paper along the shore of Great Salt Lake and let the wave wash up toward it, captured these lines. Um, and then I responded to it with my own drawing. Um, and this was something that I was working, where I was very, working very much against the idea of, of the vertical figure, um, yet this emerged anyway. Um, so it's kind of a self-portrait. Um, and that's all I have to share. Thanks for listening. And thank you all so much for sharing your beautiful work. Um, my first question is for Nan. So you mentioned this incredible 47-day vigil that you did at the lake during the last legislative session. Um, I'm wondering if there were any experiences you had on the lake that stood out to you or surprised you in some way. Uh, I'll share one that is really uh, strong in my heart. So before, candidly, before I went on vigil, I felt and heard the lake uh, communicating with me a lot in my house here in the lake bed, but not at the lake, right? And as the vigil was approaching, I felt like I was in a lot of communication. Um, with the lake. And then I got there to the camper in the winter, no one else on the island almost, and the lake was quiet. Like the lake wasn't talking to me anymore. And um, I was sad, actually. <laughs> and then I had this just kind of understanding that I don't know if the lake gave it to me, but I woke up after, you know, kind of a long night of listening and I realized, oh, it's, it's because I'm here. Like, you all the communication was really to bring me here so others would come, so the poem would happen, so this and that, and the ripples, right? Um, but I understood that she had limited energy, um, as you know, clear, right? So um, she, you know, it wasn't just conversational. And so the, the amount of communication I had directly with the lake lessened when I was on the shore in some way. But one um, thing came, and it was this. I think this was like a gift from the lake. My mom um, called me out there. My mom's my mom's eighty, and um, she shared this little story uh, about how she learned to float in Great Salt Lake. She grew up in Idaho, but her mom didn't grow up here, 
um, was bringing her my mom's family through uh, to visit. And they were visiting their grandparents who grew up here. Um, and they went out to, uh, by Saltair and they floated. And, and my mom's nine in the story, and she was scared to float. And my, my grandmother at the time, who was probably in her 30s, said, um, Look how the lake can hold my large body, showing my mom how to float. She can hold you. And that story is so tender to me, knowing that water has memory, that water meant that the water of this lake, especially, you know, is remembering everything. Um, remembering the shape of my mother's nine-year-old body, my mother's mother, my mother's mother's mother. And that uh, felt like it was a gift that the lake gave me that kind of understanding of our intimacy. And um, everything like that that's relational, I think, is just uh, so valuable to all of us. The next question is for Doug. Can you hear me? It's working. Okay, Doug, so you grew up in Tooele. Um, You mentioned that um, you would drive past the south end of the lake at least a couple of times a week growing up. Um, this sense of place is really prominent throughout your work. And in your bio, it says that you believe a sense of place and solutions-oriented dialogue are the strongest tools we have for fixing the West's socio-ecological issues. Can you tell us about what that means to you? Yeah, I mean... It's it's one of those things I've asked myself this so many times, trying to understand why my our practice can take so many different forms and look so many different ways, but it always somehow centers on the Great Salt Lake or its watershed. And it's in a way, it's not really possible to put words to why it keeps coming back to that. But I know it. The fact that it's so powerful to me makes it intuitive that it's something I want to share with other people and want to, like inquire to other people like if, like the one thing i can share is like prompts and questions to encourage others to like deepen their sense of place and really understand what's going on around them i think darren spoke earlier about um <coughs> the importance of you know teaching um arts and like local traditions before science and math and i couldn't agree with that more because for some reason i'm 27 years old and i just am so in love with the local ecology and like becoming a scientist at age 27 is kind of strange when i didn't really care for it much growing up but it's because it's specifically related to the things you care about um and then to go a little bit a little bit further from that i want to um just talk a little bit about why the great salt lake has become even more important to me. It's my, I never met my biological grandmother, but she also grew up in Tooele and lived in Tooele her whole life. And she died of multiple sclerosis in the 90s. And um, I didn't, I actually never met her, never knew her, um, but I read Chip Ward's book, uh, Canaries on the Rim, um, maybe five or six years ago. And it, it talked about how in the 90s, the MS rate in Tooele County was seven times the national average um, because of the correlated with mineral extraction in the area from magnesium and correlated with um, Kennecott copper mine and correlated, you know, the people who funded this building and uh, correlated with uh, all the military testing out there. And I just, I don't know, that like tugged me in the right way and I haven't stopped. So. Thanks, Doug. Okay, next question is for Willie. So, Willie, you have a really unique voice as an artist in Salt Lake City. Um, you are creating work about queerness and Mormonism and Utah and uh, your Salvadorian heritage. Um, you also started a collective centering around giving space and a voice to BIPOC artists. Um, can you tell us about your experience as an artist pushing boundaries around important social and ecological issues in a conservative state like Utah? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can do that. Um, I I think the my experience doing that. What what I would point to most. Um, out of that, I guess would be Glumas Colectiva as like a space that. I, is and the reason I would do that is that it's like river writing, it's kind of this community you create that catches folks so that you can care for one another 
And through that like intimacy and connection you create with each other, you're able to propel each other to do other things. I imagine that if River Writing Collective never happened, the man we see today wouldn't be here. Um, I think that there's a chance that that's true. Um, and what that has turned into for at least us as a colectiva has been all of our work as artists growing in a myriad of different ways just because when you connect with folks on that way, much like we're connecting now and educating each other with like, what you know what i've been in the corner doing doing versus what holly has been in the corner doing um it's that growth that i guess i would point to as being part of the experience when it comes to the ecological impact is because there's a few of us that are more environmentally minded that you know now that this space has been created there's folks um in our community who are now thinking about that more and engaging with that more whereas like before a lot of especially the young slammy or like poets of us weren't writing bird poems right <laughs> which like is a small move but also is part of what um is capturing it for us like the presence we've been able to have at the jordan river nature center um, on one hand has been like, hey, we're creating room for some of the really marginalized and vulnerable community members to share um, some raw stuff that they've been experiencing. Um, and at the same time, we're surrounded by nature and surrounded by a supportive community that allows the sharing of these things not to become re-traumatizing, but to become something that's like actually healing. Um, I guess I would point to that when it comes to the work I've been able to do ecological impact wise um, with Pumas Colectiva, um, a little bit larger and stepping back from that. I would point to, yes, um, some of the environmental lineup of literature that and movement that Utah Humanities has been able to kind of put forward. Um, we've been able to take Nan, for example, to do some of the stuff like the Antelope Island Poet in Residence um, different little programs like that. I smiled when you mentioned Chip Ward just because Canaries on a Rim is such an important book that I got to like encounter in Escalante, um, not through any mechanism of my own, but just because they wanted him there. And then I got to be there and be like, wow, that's a huge part of the state history that um, we don't talk about enough with like gender folks. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Okay, and so your work at Brawley is centered around community activation and bringing awareness to important <coughs> issues. Was there a particular issue or experience that inspired you to create a space that uses art to activate people? Yeah, there was. Um, before I tell you that, when I founded Brawley Arts, and Brawley is a British slang term for umbrella, so it's inclusive by design. I came at it as a dancer, which is my art form that I uh, developed over time and now use that knowledge around visual art and such with Brawley Arts. But at the time I founded Brawley Arts, Utah was losing a lot of talented artists. The talented, independent, emerging, and established artists couldn't make it because a lot of the funding was going to establish companies, institutions, and whatnot. So when I found that, I said, I can be the champion for the talented, independent artists and bridge the gap so that I could be a complement and not a threat to existing artists, arts organizations and whatnot. And that worked beautifully. And then all of a sudden I had the aha moment that, wait a minute, we as artists really want to be a part and need to be a part of what's going on in the world. And so I really changed and fine-tuned Brawley Arts so that artists would have that opportunity to step into these major issues Moving forward, in 2004, the um, Legacy Highway was on the docket with Governor Levitt. And I, for one, really love Great Salt Lake and have a lot of memories there. And when you'd hear people talking about it, they'd say, oh, it stinks, or oh, it's this, or oh, it's that. And I think it was right at that time when the first go with the Legacy Highway had been litigated as a no-go. And they were coming back for the second round to try to push it through. We decided to take on Great Salt <laughs> and um, the title of the project was called Contours, and that's the name you give to the feathers of a bird that's not related to flight, but related to form and function. 
And so what we did is we brought, we did a number of things and I'll try to be brief, but we brought in a kite maker from Tasmania whose specialty was in making kites of endangered birds. We got an ornithologist and we made kite templates and we identified 10 birds that were endangered. And we went and we were able to meet with 400 students and they each made an artistic kite. We learned about the birds and they also made, they got to pick one of the 10 birds and we were able to take all 400 kids out to the Great Salt Lake to learn about it, to experience it, to see it. In addition to that, we brought scientists, artists, dancers, musicians, you name it, to create a weekend long performance event that um, what we did is we used film and sound score to take the audience from right where they were in their seats out to the Great Salt Lake. So by the time that the performance really got going, we had taken you to the lake and we were able to introduce everyone to all the magnificence things about Great Salt Lake. Like I said, it's value, beauty. And what happened was the goal of those who were in favor of Legacy Highway had been to shift public opinion to how this would not damage the lake, that this was needed, um, that the lake really wasn't valued. And as a small arts organization, I was so excited when we got kind of a letter about what are you doing? Because we had increased value and beauty for the lake and people were talking about it and people were going out to the lake and suddenly the conversation had shifted. So you work in eco-poetic collaboration with the lake. I love that phrase so much. I have never heard the word eco-poetic until I met you. It's really beautiful. Um, can you tell us what that means to you? And can you also um, describe your process translating an ecologically disruptive landscape into art? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean it. Uh, I think um, eco poetic for me uh, is that um, kind of collaboration I touched on with the, you know, trespass, erasure, witness. Those are my practices um, for that. But I think a lot of it for me is also just practice, right? Um, visiting, going, walking, noticing, right? Um, dropping down into, uh, understanding where I'm at with all of my senses, all of them standing on my head. I used to be able to do that. Um, you know, uh, experiencing the landscape with all of it, right? Um, and then I touched on, you know, like how that work for me is actually very collaborative with Great Salt Lake always has been no idea you never know idea have any idea what you're gonna find out there right you go out there you have no idea what you're gonna find um and you have no idea maybe what you're gonna be called to do right um you saw the 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 movement example how are you gonna move no i don't know what i'm doing you know we'll figure out when we get there and that kind of attunement is that kind of eco poetic collaboration in my mind and then the second part of the question? I'm going to answer that part. Your process turning any more to your landscape and art. Oh, yeah, that's it. Then what <laughs> Then what happens, you know? <laughs> Maybe there is somebody there to take a photograph of me. Maybe there isn't that day, right? All, a lot of these things have never been filmed. Um, but in that way, they can't really be commodified. Um, and I don't really get paid for them. Just, you know, kind of stinks, but um, the uh, just having having that intentionality um, and making right. Um, that's that's the process that I that I employ. Thank you, Laura. Thank you all. Okay, we're already toward the end of the panel. Are there any questions from the audience for any of our panelists? If not, I have more than I can. <laughs> can I add one? Yeah. yeah. Now that I've had more time to think, I do want to add one thing to this sense of belonging um, that I was talking about that we're seeking to build for a lot of the like BIPOC community. Um, I think one way that that actually is directly related to the environment is that I feel oftentimes um, like 
being raised in Utah in a marginalized community, for a lot of folks, what that experience can do is create this real disconnect from just <laughs> belonging to this place or even wanting to be here. Um, a huge part of that um, would kind of prevent you from caring about what happens to this place. So I feel like one kind of indirect way that a lot of this um, more racially centered work or like LGBTQ plus centered work actually is connected here um, is that without that sense of belonging, folks won't want to fight to save this place. I think one of the two things I can point to that have created just a, a larger sense of belonging for a lot of the folks that we've been working for, um, especially within the Latinx community. Um, one is an understanding of the Uteco Aztec language family. Um, the Shoshone um, share um, you know, a historic language um, back in the days with folks all the way down from Ensalvador, which is actually where my people come from. Um, if you look at the history of different Spanish maps, um, Great Salt Lake is called Lago de Guayo. And around there, you see um, across the Southwest, but especially around this Lago de Guayo spot, um, you see like um, first homeland of the Aztecs. Now, these same maps also sometimes show California as an island, so you, you want to kind of, you know, view them with some skepticism. Um, but this is also part of what created the mythos of like an Aslan that exists within like the Southwest or Chicano and like um, parallel communities. So while a lot of the work that happens within like different BIPOC spaces or different LGBTQ plus spaces can seem like it is not connected in that way, even just some of that history and the events and the scholars that we had to bring forward just to even connect um, the Latinx and BIPOC communities here to those histories, um, they have led to folks caring more about the environment through death. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm a scientist. I see what's going on. I tell people about it and communicate my science hour, but each of you um, are speaking in a different language and maybe the science speaks. And I've learned so much from all of you. I mean, 80 years ago, your dance taught me about water. Um, really makes me smile all the time. Uh, Doug, your, your work is entrancing. Uh, man, um, you fill me with hope and love and Holly knows she she makes me cry, I always tell her that, but also your erasure work was some of the first artwork I ever saw. And it's really impactful to me. Um, all of that said together is when the artists have a different type of responsibility, different your communication is more visceral. And I think we need you to pull in off the table. And I just wonder if anybody wants to comment on the language of the arts and how effective it is in communicating things like the crisis we're raising. I just uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, I really want to respond by just to one little part of what you said. Um, and I just feel honored when you say you artists, but I want to look back at everyone in this room, including you, Bonnie, and say you artists. We are here as artists. I, I see you. I know what you're doing here today. This isn't just any symposium, right? This is about um, art and humanities being a vehicle, if not to save the lake, which maybe single-handedly it doesn't. We really do need science, and thank you, by the way. Um, but art, we can't say the lake without it. That's what's clear. We won't come into right relationship with water without it, without this frequency that runs through the heart that makes us care. But we need not just five panelists, we need all the art that you walk through the door with today. And you might think it's a secret, but I'm telling you, I see you and I'm calling us out. Um, if you can possibly stay for the last segment, we'll do something, we'll make a new piece of art and ceremony together. Um, I hope that you'll be able to do that with us. But I just, um, yes, we need this language, Bonnie, you're absolutely right. But we can all speak it to some extent more than we've been bullied out of thinking we can by capitalism. Right? So it's your native language. It's our native language. It's available. That's what I want to say.
I agree. And I think um, what Doug said earlier is also important to uh, the way I see it, which also is probably the same way Bonnie sees it, is we are inspired to ask questions, right? We don't know the answers and the arts make us question, right? So like that's part of the language. I'll just add in a little quote that I really like from Brian Eno, and it's science discovers, art digests. <laughs> there was a great, great quote from Ken Burns last year. He said, I could tell you a million facts about X, Y, or Z, and you'd probably tune me out and not remember anything. But when I tell you a great story, then I've got you. So it's through our art mediums, and Darren said this earlier today many times of how he grew up through story, art, um, nature, is that that is the way to your question, Bonnie. I think when we touch our hearts, when we connect through something that resonates with all of us, no matter what the medium is, then that's where we get into that idea of we've touched you, you're ready to step in, we can get to the heart of the crisis. And then collectively say, what can we do collectively to solve it? It has to be a grassroots approach where we're coming from hearts and minds. And I do believe that the arts, storytelling, history, humanities are the way to get there. I completely agree with what Nan says when she says that without art, we won't get there. Um, but I will say that me and Nan were joking beforehand because we're friends and we were talking about the panel. And I was like, oh, if they asked me, like, can art save the great soul? Like, I would just be like, no, and then pass the mic. And I guess what I mean by that is, is, is a bit twofold. Um, one is that I come from a tradition of artists, um, both in El Salvador and like people like the Black Art Movement, which was a literary and arts arm um of the black power movement um that frequently viewed art as just not enough um like in el salvador what happened with la generación comprometida in the 50s 60s and 70s is that it led to a violent revolution which was necessary to guarantee some basic rights um i want to say that is because as much as like the the power of story and like making people fall in love and making people um care that is crucial. But when it comes to issues of like um, violence and stuff like that, um, a lot of it comes down to power. James Baldwin has this wonderful quote where it's like, yeah, if a racist guy is over there and wants to kill me, that's his problem. But if like he has a noose and he can actually do it, now it's my problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the issues that we're facing with the environment in the lake right now are issues of power. And we have to address like how power ends up being distributed across Utah. That's why we there was a panel about historically marginalized voices beforehand, because that's a huge like power thing that we point at. Um, and I, what I think is boggling for me, uh, myself, like in my own confusion as I'm trying to figure out like, what can we do? Um, a huge part of it for me is, um, and this is my Mormon upbringing coming out. I have the quote always in my head that faith without works is dead. And I oftentimes feel similarly that art or literature without works is dead. Um, and trying to imagine what that means for me, um, oftentimes have to like for me is pointing and looking where it's been looking lately has been at the legislature and yes our voting systems the fact that we don't have an independent districting and in salt lake city's gerrymandered at all hell um just today i was kind of on social media and there was this crazy little meme i encountered that was like oh if you had ranked voting and independent redistricting in utah it would turn blue um which i mean probably wouldn't solve our water crisis right <laughs> um there's plenty of things that i would critique like both parties for doing um but issues like that are gonna be playing a bigger role when it comes to actually wanting to save our life like um love by itself can't heal anything um and, and this might be getting too personal but i'll use it as like one thing i can point to like my dad loves the shit out of me but like 
if, if like intergenerational trauma from war isn't addressed and like if you can't feed your family and if there's things like that like it doesn't matter how much you love somebody right like at a certain point you actually have to like learn how to take care of something and i think that that's what we're wrestling with the artist can get us to like hey there's how we love they can even point us to the things of like hey here's how we care but we have to act and actually do the caring Okay, we have like 15 seconds, but I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to again say your name and where people can find you and any like quick calls to action around your work or around the lake. Um, I'm Denise Cartwright. Follow us at Save Our Great Salt Lake on all the all the platforms. We've got a bunch of educational events coming up, and we're doing a rally at the Capitol in January. So we would love to have you all there. Holly Simonson, I work for Friends of Great Salt Lake. Uh, follow us too. Um, I did read some of our art catalog. If you're interested in seeing the artworks that were on display this year, um, you can come grab one. And yay. Nancy Moore. I don't usually say my last name because I'm not Nancy Moore. <laughs> Nancy Moore. <laughs> uh, River writing. Um, the poem, the book that's coming soon is called Irreplaceable. Um, please stay and help us read it. Uh, this is a direct call to action. Help us make an offering here today for the lake, for the lake to receive. Um, and also stop Magmore from dredging any more canals to the lake. Definitely agree with that. Um, my name is Doug Coleman. You can see a catalog of my work at douglascoleman.com. And I'll just leave with uh, an observation that having lived in Utah my whole life, this is the first time that I've seen uh, Republican lawmakers pay lip service, at least to saving the Great Salt Lake. And I see a wave building and I'm not gonna say something about playing bipartisan, but like, I think there's a lot of people that want the same result right now. And I wanna be, I just want to ask how we can actually get that to happen instead of creating a bigger divide. That's what I was saying. Um, Willie Palomo, you can follow my work online at palomopoemas.com or on Instagram at palomopoemas and Plumas Colectiva on Instagram. Um, I think if there was a call to action that I would have, it's that um, is to find a group or to form a group um, because it's the community and the connection that's going to sustain any work that we try to do. Um, it's easier to get caught up in the desperation and um, kind of grief of it all when you're just trying to work alone. So the more community you can build around this work, the better. Um, you can follow us at Brawley, B R O L L Y, arts.org. Check out Evaporation, the Great Salt Lake Project. Keep checking back for updates on where we're doing things, how we're doing things. Um, I would say two things. Um, Al Gore said it best there will be no climate justice until we have racial and social justice. Look into that. And a couple of things for consideration. We live in a desert. We have the second cheapest water in the nation. We are, we use, we are the second highest, we have the second highest water consumption per capita of the nation. We live in a desert. Thanks for these incredible artists. And thank you all for coming.